talking about salinity, but he's also here today on behalf of Alpharex to talk a little bit about um, the products that they have available and give you a little information about their company. So please welcome Don Young. Believe me that there was a possum out here this morning, and I have photographic evidence it was still alive. Fear not, animal control is taking care of it. So we have. We. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about our company today and uh, give you a little bit of insight on some of the products that we have to offer, and hopefully there'll be materials that uh, will give you some profit on your farm and uh, do you a good job. So, uh, essentially what I want to do is first uh, introduce uh, our company, uh, Alpharex Seeds. Uh, Oh, also, I want to make sure to uh, thank uh, High Plains Journal and uh, New Holland and, and ourselves, Al Alfrex. Uh, we really had to enjoy the opportunity to participate in this uh, conference here today, and uh, hopefully it will be a benefit to you. So, um, essentially, Alpharex, I'm not sure everybody has heard the name Alpharex or, or aware of, of our company. Uh, the name Alpharex is... Uh, Alfalfa for His Excellence is uh, where they came up with that name, the first letters of those three words. Uh, we are the forage division of Dow AgriSciences. A few years back, uh, Dow decided to uh, get involved in forages, and so they went out and uh, first bought uh, a company called Dairyland Seeds, which you're probably familiar with, uh, the hybrid alfalfa. And then a, a few years later, they uh, also bought, uh, bought another major alfalfa supplier called Cal West Seeds. And with those two acquisitions, uh, that made us one of the largest forage breeding uh, companies in North America. They combined the breeding programs of those two companies uh, into uh, Alpharex. We still market uh, the Dairyland brand, but also uh, now market Alpharex Seeds. Uh, uh, that we'll talk a little bit about uh, this morning also. Uh, as far as uh, what I want to talk about during the noon hour today is high just alfalfa. It's something that uh, as an alfalfa breeder I, I think it's pretty exciting for the industry. It's uh, low lignin alfalfa. Now you may have been hearing about uh, low lignin for a number of years and uh, there's been work done on uh, developing uh, the GMO version of low lignin. But uh, our company uh, looked at that process and uh, it takes about $150 million to bring a GMO alfalfa to market. And so our breeders uh, looked at that cost and wondered, could we actually develop an alfalfa with low lignin without having to incur all the, that cost and have to pass that on to the customer? And so we started looking at the germplasm we had and see if there was enough genetic variability out there that we, where we could actually select for low lignin without having to go the GMO uh, route. And so, after years of looking, we, we were able to uh, uh, develop a low lignin alfalfa. We've been working on it for about eight years. And at the World Dairy Expo two years ago, uh, we decided to make our announcement. Uh, it all been confidential up until that point. And then at the World Dairy Expo, uh, we made our big announcement and uh, announced the uh, release of high jest uh, low lignin alfalfa. And with that, we became the first commercially available low lignin alfalfa uh, varieties on the market. Now, we've been out there uh, about a uh, year and a half, two years now uh, with the product, and uh, it's been performing well. And by not having to incur that $150 million cost, uh, and by being non, uh, since we're non GMO, um, non transgenic on this trait, there's no tech fee, and so it made it a lot more economical when we actually got it out there in the marketplace. So, something to think about. Uh, again, conventional plant breeding, uh, low-lignin alfalfa. 
Now with our announcement uh, at World Dairy Expo, we released two varieties, High Jess 360 and High Jess 660. Now, the 360 is a fall emergency 3, the 660 is a fall emergency 6. Uh, we felt that those varieties were far enough along that essentially had all the bells and whistles that you really wanted in an alfalfa variety, but we also added the additional trait of low lignin. We wanted to make sure that when we released a variety, we didn't have something that wasn't going to perform uh, for all aspects of, of your needs out there on the farm. We wanted the low lignin trait, but we wanted to make sure that we didn't lose ground on everything else that uh, a farmer needs for an alfalfa variety. So again, the iGest 360, if you look down at the bottom, uh, really a good uh, insect and disease package. And also in the Midwest, the Phantomyces, race one and race two. That's pretty important in some of the markets that we are in. And also the, the five coffee rubber rod, all the major diseases, HR all the way across. So we felt uh, we really had a good product that also had all the things that you need in a variety, but also now had uh, the low lignin trait. Now we also, in the breeding process, uh, you know, the alfalfa breeders out there looking at hundreds of thousands of plants, and you're looking at something that has a good eye appeal, something that you think uh, will have traits that uh, uh, will be a benefit. We looked at uh, selecting the parent material that was leafy, dense, robust plant canopy, uh, high density of leaves on that plant. And so uh, the varieties that uh, we released, uh, the 360 and the 660, if you look down in the canopy, there's a lot of leaves down low. Uh, medium to large leaves and uh, fine to medium stem. So overall appearance of the, of the product in addition to having less lignin in the tissue uh, uh, was a good variety. The 660 again uh, had again a good disease package, good insect package. I heard somebody mention today uh, cowpea aphid. Uh, we also have resistance to the cowpea aphid. We're one of the few companies that have actually looked at uh, getting resistance to that, that insect. So. Again, a good package out there and good uh, two varieties initially. We'll eventually have more uh, varieties, uh, but the first two out on the market were the HiGest 360 and HiGest 660. Again, uh, good looking plants, uh, high leaf density throughout the canopy. So, why are we talking about low lignin alfalfa? What does that mean to you as a producer? Uh, if, we, if you buy a low lignin variety, uh, what does that mean? What, why would you do that? And, and what advantage would it have to you in your operation? Well, first of all, what is lignin and how is it in the plant? What does it do in the plant? Well, lignin is a complex organic compound that binds to cellulose fibers and hardens and strengthens the cell walls. If you meant listen to uh, AJ's talk this morning, he talks about the tree out there and the, the lignin giving it the support. So lignin in the tissue actually gives that plant support and does a few other things as far as uh, benefit in the plant, but uh, as the plant matures, it develops more and more lignin in the tissue, and that becomes a, uh, an issue as far as animal digestion and negatively affects forage quality. So from a plant breeding aspect, what we want uh, to do is provide a product to you that's highly digestible. And so if you look at a, a bale of hay, uh, we know that a large portion of that uh, bale is digestible, but because of the lignin uh, content in the tissue, part of that bale is less digestible and not as available to the, to the animal when you feed it to them. So from a plant breeding aspect, the question was, can we reduce the amount of lignin in that tissue and also uh, in the process have more of that hay bale that's digestible and available to that, that animal that you feed it to? And so from the work that we did on the breeding, we found that we could reduce uh, lignin by about 7 to 10% by conventional plant breeding. And we felt that that was enough to give us a, a real advantage as far as uh, forage quality, but not to the point where we started seeing lodging. We know that if you take too much lignin out of the tissue, you can get lodging, and, and that's a whole other issue that we don't, don't want to have in our, our alfalfa varieties out there in the field. So, we felt that we could reduce lignin by 7 to 10 percent, and we accomplished that. And essentially, again, uh, we've had our alfalfas out on the market for about a year. We've had about 10,000 acres out this last year, and we have not seen a lodging issue on our alfalfa varieties, the high gest material. We have got uh, a quality advantage, but uh, our, essentially what we're saying is that these uh, high gest, low lignin varieties are not going to be any better or any worse than the varieties you've had 
from us in the past as far as lodging. So uh, we felt we got the quality advantage, but not really uh, having a disadvantage as far as lodging. So uh, when you talk about alfalfa, if you look down on the bottom of this table, you'll see a, a number of days from 7 to 42 days. And we know that when we cut alfalfa and we start to, uh, the alfalfa starts to regrow, uh, in the past, we've always tried to hit that happy compromise of yield and quality. And we've cut uh, alfalfa at 10% bloom. Well, if we let it go a little bit farther on growth, the alfalfa will got more tonnage, but we've got more, uh, uh, less quality because of the ligand that's building up in the tissue. And so for years and years, we always told the farmer, well, let's cut it 10% bloom. We'll have decent yield, but also decent quality. Well, what the aspect of the low lignin does is it gives us a whole other look at uh, forage quality and yield. We know that uh, as alfalfa is regrowing and it uh, approaches maturity, uh, the lignin is starting to build up in the tissue. Here, this bottom line is the uh, uh, lignin building up in the tissue over time. And so at 10% bloom, you have this amount of lignin in the tissue, and this amount of quality is around 10% bloom. Well, what we've done on the breeding end of it, we've actually found individual plants in our parent population that uh, actually deposit lignin into the tissue at a slower rate. And so by looking at hundreds of thousands of plants, we could actually come up with an alfalfa variety that actually deposited lignin at a slower rate into the tissue. And essentially what we've done is we've shifted this lignin curve to the right to about seven days. Now that, from a breeding aspect, that throws out uh, several different opportunities to the producer out there. So if in the past you've harvested, say, at 28 days, you have now with a lower lignin variety an alfalfa tissue that has less lignin in it than what you're used to in the past at 28 days. So if you want to uh, just continue cutting on your normal cutting schedules at 28 days, as an example, you would have alfalfa that was better quality at that stage than what you're used to in the past. So, because you have less lignin in the tissue. But also, you can look at it in another aspect. That is, say, if you're ready to cut it 28 days and the storm's coming up, and there's going to be a, a rain coming in, and you don't want to lay down a bunch of hay, uh, in the past, you might delay your harvest, but the problem was that the alfalfa matured so much that you didn't have good quality alfalfa after that rain. And it was just uh, a lot more tonnage, but uh, again, uh, the alfalfa wasn't good. It just went from very quality hay to feeder hay. So with the aspect of the low lignin alfalfa, by shifting that uh, lignin curve to the right about seven days, we have a wider harvest window. So now if you wanted to delay your harvest and avoid that rainstorm or, or whatever uh, reason for delaying your harvest, you could harvest at, say, 35 days versus 28 days. And the lignin content now is comparable at 35 days at what it used to be at 28 days. But you've also had seven more days of growth. So that throws out uh, several opportunities there for the producer. You can actually harvest the alfalfa on its normal cutting schedule and have the potential for even higher quality hay than what he's used to in the past. Or you can delay his harvest up to seven days and still, instead of having feeder quality hay, you would have alfalfa that was comparable uh, to what uh, you used to have at 28 days as far as forage quality. So that throws out a lot of opportunities there for the producer. And I think uh, that has some real advantages depending on how you want to approach the market or the utility of the product. Now, like I said, we've been out on the market for a, about a, a year, a year and a half now. Uh, the first year update, uh, we, any producer that uh, bought our product last year, we uh, uh, gave them a kit, a forage quality test kit. And we said, well, when you uh, start to produce hay off that field, take your uh, forage quality sample, send it into Rock River Labs, and uh, we'll pay for the test. And so we did that. We worked with, uh, you may have heard Courtney's talk uh, earlier this morning in one of the other sessions. Uh, she's from Rock River Lab. We were working with them and looking at uh, providing this uh, forage quality test. Well, when that, those farmers started harvesting our high test materials, they took that forage quality sample, sent it into the lab. The farmer got the analysis back, but they also, the lab sent me a copy of every one of those tests so we could see 
how our alfalfas were doing across the country and how they were performing. So we've had a, a year under our belt now. And also uh, at the World Dairy Expo this year, one of the farmers that uh, bought some of our alfalfa entered the uh, Quality Counts Hay and Haylage class uh, contest at the World Dairy Expo. And uh, he entered this test uh, several years in the past and never had won it before. Well, this year with our high 360, he won that contest at the World Area Expo. So it gives us a little bit of validation that, that we are producing a product that is testing good and uh, has that forage quality. Here's the grower, uh, the grower is uh, Joe Burney out of uh, Washington. But again, uh, we have farmers out there that are really testing this varieties and uh, they're, they're lacking the performance of it. Here's the test kit that we had. Uh, again, uh, uh, we provided that kit free of charge to the growers and uh, tried to get some information back on the performance of our varieties. Now one thing that we want to look at as we move forward in the industry of uh, out there producing these varieties, uh, low ligand varieties, how is you as producer, are you going to get paid for that or how can you measure that advantage of the low ligand? We know that some of the forage quality tests that producers have been using in the past, like uh, relative feed value, the RFV, or uh, TDN, those type of uh, analysis really don't pick up the advantage of the low ligand varieties. The RFQ will pick it up a little bit better, but uh, like Courtney was talking about in some of her talk uh, this morning, uh, University of Wisconsin came up with a new test for us. It's called Total Tract Nutrient Detergent Fiber Digestibility. Not a mouthful, but again, uh, TTN, the FD, is a, a test that will actually measure the advantage of the low lignin uh, varieties that are being marketed out there. Here's an example of that. We had uh, farmers in the past said, well, they, they've sold hay to dairies, and sometimes the RFV was the exact same value. Uh, they had two hay lots, they sold it to the dairy, uh, same RFVs on both of them. Uh, here an example, lot one, lot two. RFV on both those were essentially the same. But the dairy came back and said, well, one of those milk better than the other. And like you can see here, the RV essentially the same, NDF essentially the same. But when we ran a TT NDFD test, there were seven units difference on those values. And for a two to three unit change in TT NDFD, that's a pound of milk. And so as we move forward in the industry, be aware that uh, there are some new tests out there that can really identify the advantage of these low ligand varieties and that some of the tests that you may have been using in the past won't pick up that advantage. So again, uh, like I said, we uh, had these uh, tests out, uh, this producer, uh, uh, high just uh, low ligand alfalfa varieties filed for about a year. And we're, all these tests that have been sent back to me, we're seeing that we are delivering at least a 7 to 10% uh, reduction in lignin. Uh, the average TTNDL, uh, TTNDFD values have shown at least a, a pound of milk uh, per day per cow increase. And so uh, we are seeing some advantage out there, and I think we do have some uh, varieties that have some potential, whether it's dairy production or beef production. Uh, really, we're providing a product that's more digestible and has some real advantages. So. Uh, we do have, I also interviewed a lot of growers that uh, raised our alfalfa this last year. If you want to listen to those uh, testimonials, you can go to our website, www.alpharexseeds.com. And uh, again, uh, thank you for attending here today and uh, learning more about our products. And, and I think in your packet there's some information that, uh, some rewards uh, inside that packet. And I'll uh, be sure to take advantage of that. So with that, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Don, inside their packets is also one of those feed tests, correct? So if you haven't looked inside your packet, that TTN DFD test that he was talking about, Alpharex has provided you with, with one of those. So thank you very much.